six and zero. Oh, the Embiidless Sixers are riding a hot streak coming out of the All Star break. We're going to talk all about that today. Uh, Philly spring training in full swing, and also uh, Eagles off season in full swing. We're talking all things Philly sports on this episode of Sports Talk Philadelphia. Hello, welcome. I am John Kohlmeyer, the host of Sports Talk Philadelphia. It's been a minute since we've been here, two weeks. Uh, a lot has happened in the two weeks for Philly sports. I'm joined by my uh, friend and co-producer, Caleb Fla- nice Flieger. Flieger. Got it. Uh, <laughs> I usually say Flieger. I got it right now. And uh, here we go. Aiden Tixin- Tixinski. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Aiden. How are you doing? Um, doing well. And Tyler Small joining the panel today as well. My name's easy. <laughs> yeah, very easy. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, the Sixers are 6-0, six and um, riding hot streak. Uh, if we can get the st- standings up here, the uh, Nets are right behind them, one game behind. Uh, and the Sixers, I, 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 the next graphic, I keep putting this graphic up every week with the Nets right underneath them because I keep thinking that the Nets are going to surpass them. And every week, the Sixers surprise <laughs> me. Um, so, Caleb, talk to me about the success. Uh, Kind of unexpected for me personally. I didn't really think they would still be number one at this point in the season. But what is the factor leading to that? Yeah, I thought I think many Sixers fans were probably unexpected by the start, especially after the All Star break when we found out that Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid were going to be out for the first few games due to COVID nineteen protocol rules. But the Sixers have played together as a team, and a lot of players on the team have stepped up. You see Seth Curry's back the way he was playing at the start of the season. Shake Milton's coming off the bench, scoring a lot of points there. So a lot of other people on the team are stepping up and. I think a lot of Sixers fans are shocked that we're still retaining the first seed because we have two of our best players have been out for most of these games now coming back and somehow we're still ahead of the Nets, but we'll see how long it lasts for. Yeah, and that big comeback last night, they were behind for most of the game and and they found a way to hang in there until the fourth quarter. Tyler, what's fueling the success for the Sixers team, especially without Embiid right now? I mean, Caleb hit the head in the nail right now. It is a full team effort that's really come together and you see it throughout the team numbers. I mean... If you look here with the turnovers compared to assist numbers, they're down on an average of ratio of 1.4%. If you look at three-point shooting, it's 41% since the All-Star break as opposed to 36.4%. And in just allowed points, it's 100.3 right now, where it was 111.2 coming into this first half of the season. So the full team just overall as a unit has played a lot cleaner in quality of a basketball alongside just a lot of bench scoring. I mean, Firkin is averaging 14 over this span. Shake Milton, like usual, averaging 13. And then Dwight Howard has just kind of had a resurgent point of the season. So it's been a mixture of utilizing him and other bigs off the bench. But at the same time, they, they got to be able to play small like they have, been able to get up and down the floor. And the ability to do that throughout the three-point shooting has been pretty great. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up Furcon because I think we're really seeing him step up and and really take charge of that bench right there. Aiden, uh, if there was one bench player that you would hinge all the success on for this team, especially without Embiid, like I said, uh, who would that be for you? I just think, uh, Perkman, as you guys said, but I'm also looking at Shake Milton. He's really been the leader uh, off the bench the entire season. Uh, He's just a guy that you can, if you trust one of the bench players to really score, uh, that's really him. Uh, He's a guy that plays really, has been playing really well with uh, Ben Simmons. So I think that Shake Milton is really the guy that you're looking at off the bench to sort of lead them. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, they're finding ways the bench is, and the team as a whole, to win games in a variety of ways. Yesterday we saw a comeback win and then 22 point margins in, in wins against Chicago, Washington, San Antonio. They're, they're really dominating teams in some ways and they're winning in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, I'll just skip to the big question. Uh, Tyler, is it too premature to say that this team is a real championship contender, not just for the one seed in the East, but really a, a championship? It depends how the stretch without Embiid goes. I think that's really what it comes down to because obviously when Embiid is on the floor, they're a championship caliber team as much as everyone likes to give it to the Nets just because they have a lot of flashy names with Blake Griffin. Blake Griffin being added to that squad. But if you really look at it, I was just talking about my praise for Howard. I don't think he's a valuable option going forward as your sole piece. And whether that means going out and attacking for another big big man in the free agency market or 
anything along that. I mean, he only has one game this season with above 15 minutes per game. And he's only started four games. And in those games, he has 8.3 points per game and a plus minus of negative 5.9. So he's not a viable option. And if you look at Tony Bradley off the bench, he's not really doing it either. So it's, again, use, utilizing that. They only have 100 minutes where they have either Trent Bradley or anyone else smaller on their court as their biggest on the top five. And when they do that, it's, they still are effective. I mean, they have a plus minus of 85 in points. And have an effective field goal, it obviously goes up because it's more shooters on the court. So with that ability to, to kind of work with a smaller unit, almost like the Houston Rockets kind of made famous when James Harden was there, would be their best option to kind of prove that they are a, a playoff caliber without Embiid, which becomes championship caliber. Yeah. yeah, and the Sixers have done what you call it off, but the Sixers' next six games, they have the Bucks, the Knicks, the Warriors, the Lakers, the Nuggets, and uh, yeah, those six. I mean, when you have those six without Embiid, I mean, I think that's going to be a rough stretch for the Sixers coming up. I mean, I know we only have a one-game lead right now, but we could probably see that one game lead dwindle away when you start to face top teams in the West coming up. So it's going to be a good test for the Sixers. And even if they lose that, I just want to preface that, it depends how they look in those losses. Like there, there have been some Sixers teams out there that look like the teams of the past that are about to, the wheels are going to come off when April hits on the calendar. But if they go into those games, they have competitive matchups, the bench continues to score and they show and utilize their depth, that's going to be the main difference. And we, we also should talk about Tobias Harris with that game yesterday obviously coming up uh, big you saw him mouthing the, the I'm an all-star thing I, I think people heard it at the arena um, is, is Tobias the the key for this team Caleb going forward is he does their success hinge on him or is it somebody like Ben Ben Simmons you know I don't think their whole season is going to be dependent on Tobias Harris, but he's going to be a major part to how they're going to go in this playoffs. I mean, you saw, I know a lot of people watched the Knicks game last night. That first half, the Knicks were just blowing them out, and Tobias kept them in that game. He was four for four from threes in the first half of that game. Without his offense and without his shooting last night, I mean, the Sixers get blown out. I mean, the 30 point performance, and he was showing why he is an all star this year, and he should have been. He was complete snow, but. We'll see how, like uh, Doc Rivers said, stars are born in the playoffs, and I think Tobias Harris is going to show what a uh, true star he is in the playoffs this year. Yeah, and Aiden, I want to ask you about Ben Simmons now. Uh, there's a lot of talk about Ben Simmons uh, in the absence of Embiid uh, getting some real defensive uh, time in the spotlight. Uh, a lot of talk about him winning Defensive Player of the Year. Is that a possibility to you? Do you think uh, that could happen this year? I think it really, uh, he should win this year, uh, not only because he's just an elite defender, period, but because he can defend any position. I mean, you saw how Doc Rivers has been using him without Embiid. Uh, he's being used more as like a power forward type center on defense, and that's actually helped the Sixers out a lot because it's forcing uh, other guys to step up. I mean, Tobias Harris has played better defense because of the way Simmons has played down low. And I just want to like second that because I think you bring up a great point that some of the defensive metrics, when you look at him, he's 13th in the NBA with 1.8 defensive win share points. And when it comes to opponent plus minus, he's only 18th. But when you ratio that to just when he's moving off the ball, he's guarding all five positions, basically. He's such a rotation-based defender, especially without the loss of their size. And that's the beauty that you get with a mobile big point guard like he is. So I think that he kind of gets slighted by the defensive metrics, because if you go by defensive metrics, Rudy Gobert is going to win for the next 15 years, basically. So I think that they really need to take that into consideration, especially because if you look at the top two, I think it's him and Gobert that are fighting for it. They're top two in the East and West. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see as we head down the second half of the season. Real fast before we wrap up Sixers talk, I'll go around. Uh, this is my favorite segment, Nostradamus. Uh, <laughs> Sixers play the Bucks tonight, big game, big test without Embiid, taking on Giannis, the former MVP. Uh, Caleb, What's the headline tomorrow for the Sixers? <laughs> I uh, sadly think the Sixers' uh, win streak is going to come to an end tonight just because the Bucs, they're a top three team in the East right now. They're a one and a half game back from the Sixers currently, too. I mean, you got Giannis, you got, you got a really good team over there. I think there's going to be too much tonight without Embiid. But even with the Sixers being at home and such a good home team as they are, I still think they aren't, uh, they aren't going to have enough tonight. Tyler Nostradamus. Uh, so what I think the headline is going to be is that their hot shooting as of so far when they go into this Milwaukee matchup, it's going to come to a scratching halt. I think that they're not going to be able to shoot well because the Bucks are one of the best teams, not only at shooting the three, but having the opposition not shoot the three well. So I think that they're going to kind of shut down Curry from the outside, who, by the way, if we're talking about role players stepping up and doing their part, Seth Curry has been playing out of his mind since the All-Star break. So I think he's going to have a cold night and the entire team's going to fall with it.
Aiden, what about you? All right, so I guess I'm going to be on an island here. I'm going to go uh, Tobias uh, Simmons lead Sixers to victory. Uh, I think that they've been playing really well together. I think that, again, the way Simmons has been playing defense, I think is going to help them a lot. And the way that Tobias is playing, there's a chance he could have a cold game just because he started out so hot, but I think he's going to continue his hot streak out of the All-Star break. I love it. I love it. Um, okay, and with that, we will wrap off Sixers talk. We'll move into Philly spring, tra- spring training talk. Um, it's been a few weeks. The season starts in uh, two weeks, I guess. What's today? 17th? Something like that. Uh, yeah, two weeks and uh, spring training. Tyler, talk to me about uh, who you're seeing this spring training. Uh, who's the biggest surprise player for you? I didn't get a chance to talk about him, and I don't know if he's necessarily a surprise because he has, he's not going to do anything that makes you excited. But the Philadelphia Phillies signing Jeff Mathis, this is a deep cut for everyone that likes baseball and is a nerd like me, because Jeff Mathis has played since 2005, and he's never had an OPS plus, where the average is 100, of above 50, so he's half as good as the average player offensively, just because he's a longtime catcher, and he's always been reliable and consistent for them and any team that he's played for. He hit a home run in spring training. He's got an average of 170, and if he comes up for this major league squad and takes the option, He's going to be doing exactly that. He's going to catch a game. He's going to be so boring to watch, and I love that the Phillies have him. So get ready for Jeff Mathis' season. I don't even know who Jeff Mathis is, so I'm (laughs) excited as well. You got me pumped. Uh, Aiden, uh, I'm going to give you the rotation that I saw projected for the Phillies. You got Aaron Nola, of course, Zach Wheeler, Zach Eflin. I don't know if I even have the right names there. Um, Matt, Matt Moore, I saw the new acquisition, and Chase Anderson. Again, I don't know who Chase Anderson is, but uh, are you surprised that Spencer Howard might not make this team or, or disappointed in any way? Not really, and that's just because the Phillies have really done a good job adding pitchers to their starting rotation. I mean, you didn't even mention Vince Velasquez, who's always been in the starting rotation for the last three, four years. So that just shows you the depth they had. I think that if any of these guys struggle, um, Vince Velasquez, again, is a good option. But I think they'll definitely bring up Spencer Howard if they think they need to. But again, that just shows you how well the Phillies have done this offseason, adding deep pitching. Yeah, uh, Caleb, what about you? Are you surprised about Spencer, Spencer Howard? Uh, I'm not, I'm not overly disappointed in him. I think he'll probably be in the bullpen to start off the season, which is fine with me, but I want to touch more on Matt Moore and Chase Anderson. So Matt Moore in spring training so far, he's pitched eight innings, allowed one earned run total, three hits and five strikeouts. And then you look at Chase Anderson, who scored seven scoreless innings so far, eight strikeouts and three hits. I mean, that is the four and five pitching that the Phillies have been needing. They've been wanting that for the past three to five years now. And I'm hoping because the Phillies got both of them, Anderson and Moore, off very cheap deals. So this could be a very good deal for signing for the Phillies. I mean, especially if they put up this type of production in the regular season, especially as four and five pitchers when, you know, the Phillies, they have Aaron Nolan, Zach Wheeler as their one-two punch. You have Zach Eflin at your third spot. So the big, the four and five spot has been a big question mark for this team. And I think Matt Moore and uh, Chase Anderson are going to fill that this year. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, and... Uh, just speaking of the NL East and, and the moves that the Phillies have made this season, this offseason, they, uh, they made a lot of moves, I think, more than most people expected. Uh, so, Tyler, if you could just give me a preview of the NL East. The, do the, six, uh, the Phillies have a chance to win the NL East, or is it the Braves' division to lose? It is the Braves' division to lose. There's obviously the 2019 champs and the Washington Nationals there as well. The Mets made a whole ton of moves, and the Marlins were a playoff team last year. It's a gauntlet of a division. And worse things worse, when you go to interleague play, the National League East is playing the American League East, who have some of the top three the World Series Rays, the Yankees, who are one of the favorites, and the Blue Jays, who added a ton of depth. So they got a gauntlet of a schedule. I think it's going to be one of the divisions that whatever team gets to 90 wins first is probably going to win it. The Phillies have a great chance to do it, and it all comes in terms of their bullpen. So obviously they got people like Archie Bradley, Hector Neris, you know what you're going to get from him. What are you going to get from Ranger Suarez, who I think is an underrated kind of guy? Who are you going to get from Jojo Romero? you got to look at people like that, and that is going to be the difference in gutting out these games because when you look at the Phillies start to the schedule, they start off against the Braves, the Mets, the Braves, the Mets, back-to-back. It's going to be – it could either be – we could be talking in May about the Phillies potentially selling at the trade deadline, or we could talk about the first-place Phillies just, like, rolling and trying to add more depth to their team. So it's going to be a wild start to the season. And it actually makes these spring training at bats, which I usually don't think matter. They matter a little bit more this season. It could go either way. Aiden, uh, give me your player that you're watching this season for the Phillies. 
So the player that I'm going to watch, um, he wasn't talked about as much last year, but he was such a good addition. I think he's going to have a really key uh, part this year in the team playing well with Zach Wheeler. Uh, last year in a very shortened season, he had 53 strikeouts, a 2.92 ERA, and four wins and 11 starts. And again, he did all that in a shortened season. So I'm excited to see him once he gets to play more games, how important he's going to be to that starting rotation playing well on the back end of him and uh, Aaron Nola at the one and two. Caleb, give me your play that you're watching this year before we wrap up. I'm going to do Bryce Harper. I mean, I know he's a big time player on the uh, Phillies, but like two years in a row now, he hasn't had the MVP numbers that everyone was expecting. He's still a great player, but I really think that this year Bryce Harper is going to re uh, solidify his name as one of the top players in the MLB, and I really believe he is. As we've seen in spring training, he's hit a couple bombs already. Even Larry Boa said his bat speed, the way he's swinging the bat right now, that might be 40 to 50 home runs this season. So it's going to be very exciting to see what Bryce does. Yeah, it'll be very interesting. And with that, we will move into Eagles talk. Let's talk about the Eagles. Offseason, <laughs> officially in full swing. Brand new uh, leagues, league year has begun. Look at that graphic. I made that crossed Wentz right on out. Put in uh, Jalen Hurts. But it might not even be a Jalen Hurts error yet. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so they haven't really made any moves yet. Uh, they have a lot of things on the plate. I would imagine Ertz is gone. Uh, Brandon Brooks is being talked about and Fletcher Cox. Uh, Caleb, who are you seeing the Eagles going for, dealing? What do you say? Yeah, I mean, for Eagles fans, we just look at this. This is a bunch of question marks all over the table right now. I mean, we haven't made a signing of free agency yet because we don't have the money to do it because our cap situation is completely screwed up. But we were paying a guy $34 million that's not even on our roster right now. So we have that. And then we have aging players that are in their prime that are the best players on our team. So it's going to be an interesting way to see how the Eagles handle this. I think you're going to see a lot of longtime Eagles favorites that are going to have to depart. It's going to be hard goodbyes to say, but I'm thinking names like Fletcher Cox, that's a 25 million cap hit this year that might be dealt. I'm thinking Zach Ertz is already he's exploring a trade right now. And even Brandon Brooks, that's another 20 million right there. So it's a lot of big names, but you've got to look at their at the end of their primes right now. They're aging out, they're at 32, 33, 34 years old. I mean, how many more years do they have left? And the Eagles are in the stage right now as an organization that they're in a rebu rebuild mode right now. And they're trying to get younger, they're trying to get cheaper contracts. So we'll see how it goes, but not looking good for the Eagles right now. Rebuild, uh, well, I wanted to ask you, Aiden, do you think that this team is in full-blown full rebuild mode now? Not yet, and that's only because they're keeping a lot of the pieces that were keys to that Super Bowl win. Uh, I think that this is a bit of a refresh, uh, not necessarily a rebuild. I think that they're going to bring in a couple of younger pieces, keep some of the older guys, just as veteran experience. Uh, I think that if this year doesn't go well or goes as bad, as poorly as last year did, then we're going to be talking about a full rebuild. But I think at this point, they're just trying to bring in a couple of young guys with the old veterans and see how this year plays out. Uh with that, I want to do a little segment, a new segment I made up. Uh, <laughs> Wheel of Free Agency. Oh, wait, no. Wheel of Football Fortune. I have the wrong name on here. Yeah, I made this up. Wheel of Football Fortune, W-O-F-F. Uh, you say, look at that. They were, the Eagles were actually on Wheel of Fortune the other night. You see that? Did you see that puzzle right there? No. <laughs> well, it's, it's supposed to say fire, Howie Roseman. I don't know. I thought it was fun. It's not as fun. Um, <laughs> it actually, you can interpret that another way, too. Look at that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, Wheel of Football Free Agency, I don't know what the name is. I'm going to give you names, and you say yay or nay to the Eagles going for them. So, Caleb, I'll start with you. Wide receiver Kenny Galladay from the Detroit Lions. Yay. I love him, but we don't have money, so yay, assume, for, yay for me. If we had money, yay. Assume yay. we had money. Yay. Assume we have, like, Instead of like the 30th worst cap space in the NFL, yay. assume we have the 15th worst. 100% I want him on my team. Okay, yay, yay to Kenny Galladay. Tyler, I don't know who's next. Let me find who is next. I, I could make it easier for you. Go I, ahead. I am not as optimistic as you guys. I think that they are in a full rebuild. I think the first move that they make, whether it's dishing up, of Fletcher Cox or something is just going to be the open of the floodgates for that. So I'm going to say nay to everyone here except for, Ale <laughs> except for Alejandro Villanueva because he is, if you need... If you need durability to try and build around Hurts where you're trying to build him up like that, then get someone that hasn't missed a game since 2014 when you have an aging line that just seems to be out every other day. So besides that, I'm all nays, sorry. Okay, let me cross out Kenny Galladay. Let me put a check mark next to Villanueva. Aiden, I'll <laughs> go to you. Are you optimistic at all about Mel Melvin Ingram? So uh, I would say yay, except for the fact that not only do we not have money, we've never spent money on any linebacker pretty much ever since Holly Roseman's been the GM. So. 
even though I'm optimistic that we could sign maybe one of these guys, we definitely wouldn't sign Melvin Gordon, just looking at historically what the Eagles have done at linebacker. Yeah, well, I, okay. Well, you guys are no fun. How about how about <laughs> Patrick Peterson? Is that is that <laughs> we're, we're not going for anybody? Well, he's old. So. Well, I was just gonna say, coming coming from a Cardinals fan, yeah. here, he is aging out of that position at a pretty brutal rate. So I think even if they were in a buy now mode, that's a bad buy. Are, are you even saying no to Deshaun Watson if they could get him? I mean, if they could get him, but then you literally have no future. And I know that the Rams are kind of proving that not having a first round pick in that crazy statistic where they haven't had a first round pick in the last six drafts and the Raiders have had multiple and look at where the two teams have stood so far. But that being said, I think the Eagles need a future even if they, even if they can't draft right. Yeah, a lot of pessimism here uh, for the <laughs> Eagles. Uh, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, I don't even want him anyway, um, <laughs> no. but he apparently is uh, on the trade block or something. Um, I'll go to backup question here. Uh, we saw Jalen Hurts working out in a facility with uh, some young receivers, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, uh, Devontae Smith. Uh, Devonta Smith, he, he was working out. With, okay, um, well, does, <laughs> I guess it doesn't get you excited because you're all a bunch of pessimists. But but does it get you excited at all to see that? I mean, at least it's showing that Howie Roseman's thinking in the right direction. He's having his future quarterback, young young quarterback, working out with potential wide receivers that we need on our team. I mean, past two years we saw that when we passed on known like. DK Metcalf and Justin Jefferson, that's the last time Howie Roseman should ever pass on a wide receiver that's just handed to him. I mean, you got Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell, even Kyle Pitts, I really like a lot. I mean, you got four viable options right there, and if none of those four are on our team to start the 2021 season, I think a lot of Eagles fans are going to be very disappointed. Tyler, uh, real fast, are you uh, excited at all for the prospect of Jalen Hurts leading this team? I mean, yeah, it's, uh, once again, it's a bridge quarterback. I mean, you're going to get to build around him. He's going to make for competitive games. He's going to make it fun for the fans to see. But, and if he gets one of these guys like Jalen Water or Devontae Smith, I mean, it's going to be a blast. But it's going to be a blast in a 20-point loss. All right. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll go into Fast Five here um, to wrap up the show. Uh, I'll start with you again, Tyler. Uh, this Week in Baseball, my favorite segment. <laughs> Everyone's favorite segment. Yes. And I'm not going to get as bad as I did with Jeff Mathis, but – I'm just going to talk quickly about the minor leagues right here because they're doing a lot to change the rules. They always do to kind of have it as a feeder to see what will work in Major League Baseball. And they're going to try and manipulate some of the stuff that they do for ships. And I am a fan of numbers. I am a fan of teams doing whatever they can to get a competitive advantage numerically, not with cheating like the Astros. And when you look at it, even though I do like that in essence, it kind of takes the fun out of defense. The fact that you can't see guys like Byron Buxton really – haul it down from the center infield and make phenomenal plays. Same with some of the shots like Andrelton Simmons and guys like that, because they're put in the exact position where the ball's gonna be hit, and if it, they're not, then it's just a guaranteed base hit. It takes out some of the fun for new fans in baseball, and I think for the growth of the game, it'll be better if they kind of manipulate the shift a little bit more. All right, Aiden, uh, we're seeing March Madness make a return after a uh, year hiatus. Uh, who are you looking at as a possible team that can win this year? Yeah, so I have a couple of teams that I'm pretty high on. Uh, I'm high on Michigan. I know that they didn't win the Big Ten tournament, uh, and they lost a couple of key pieces, but I think that they can come back after uh, having off and really figuring out what they need to do to win. Uh, Illinois, I'm super high on. Uh, they Again, they won the tournament. They were very competitive this year. And another team that I'm high on is also Baylor. Uh, they were a great three-point shooting team this year. I look for them to be good. Uh, two teams I'm also looking at to make pretty big upsets. Georgetown, they won uh, their tournament. Uh, the Big East, uh, they weren't really expected to. And the other team that I'm looking to do an upset, have an upset is uh, Liberty. They're not really talked about too much, but they did win the Atlantic Sun this year, and they've been known to have upsets in the past. So look for them also to be, cause some problems in brackets. All right, Tyler, uh, like I said, the free agency season has started for the NFL. Who's one uh, free agent signee that you've seen so far that really excites you? So there's a lot of teams I like have done, especially the Jaguars with Shaquille Griffin and Marvin Jones Jr., but Matthew Judon to the Patriots is massive. I mean, you could talk about Hunter Henry and Janu Smith who are really going to add something, but then again, they have Cam Newton throwing to them, so I'm not worried about that, especially not Nelson Aguilar because Cam Newton can't throw it deep anymore and he's a deep threat. But Matthew Judon is another quarterback-esque on the defensive side. He knows how to not only play his position, but to maneuver the troops and 10 other players on the defensive side the way that he does. He is an electric addition to this team, and the Patriots are unfortunately going to be back. Yeah, I think it's surprising that they went with Cam Newton again for another season. I, I didn't expect that. Um, Caleb, I'll go to you for this one. More likely to be traded, uh, Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson? 
Yeah, I think this is a very interesting situation if you're an NFL fan because I don't know if I can remember the last time two top five quarterbacks were just on the trade block like this. It's, mm -hmm. it's crazy, but I think we all saw that the Bears even offered for Russell Wilson three first-round picks, two starters, and three third-round picks, and the Seahawks said no. So we'll see how it goes. I mean, both quarterback, it's going to be a hefty price. It's probably going to be around four to five first-round picks, and whoever gives that up, I mean, you better have a lot of young players and a lot of good free agent signings to build around that team because you're not going to have a lot of draft capital and not a lot of draft uh, space to do anything with that. So I would go with Watson, the most likely to get traded, but – it's going to be very interesting to see how it pans out. Do you think, you don't think the Eagles have any chance? No, nah, and whoever wrote that report about the Eagles being in on Watson, that's, yeah. that's a oh. bunch of crap. They're just going for clicks on that one. That, there's no way that happens. Well, no way. Eagles fans live in dreamland sometimes. So. No uh, way. Well, uh, last, this wasn't even a question. Happy birthday, Joel Embiid, 27 <laughs> years old yesterday. Uh, let's, let's go around, give a warm round of applause. It's our MVP. Happy birthday. We love you, Joel Embiid. Um, yeah, that's all I got for you today. Uh, thank you for tuning in for, to Sports, Sports Talk Philadelphia. Um, check out our Twitter, at Sports Talk LTV. Uh, we post a lot of fun stuff there. So go ahead and give us a follow. Uh, once again, I am John Kohlmeyer. Thank you for watching this week. Uh, we will see you next week.